Welcome to Fox Valley in Focus, a look at the issues and items of interest to residents of the Fox Valley. I'm Cindy Bravos. On this edition, we'll take a closer look at the common people who do uncommon things for the good of the community. We're talking about the good people who are part of the Sandwich Emergency Management Agency. That's their tagline and the principles they use to create a plan and execute it in the time of crisis. We welcome Tom Sikora, director of Sandwich EMA. Welcome to the program. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Now, emergency management is what we used to know in the olden days as civil defense. That's correct. Give us a, a kind of a, a timeline on, on how we've changed or evolved from civil defense to emergency certainly, management. Certainly, certainly. Back in, during wartime, the Second World War, it was formalized as civil civil defense, mostly air raid wardens. And these were just volunteers that uh, maintained the blackouts along the coastlines in the coastal towns and what have you. And uh, a lot of it was people that knew somebody that were given a title for a reason, but there was a core of folks that took it very seriously and actually planned and prepared as if there were going to be an enemy invasion. And were most of those people volunteers? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, as a matter of fact, many of my peers and myself were volunteers for a very long time. It wasn't until the late 70s, early 80s when uh, the federal level transitioned from Cold War duck and cover and fallout shelters to all hazards which all hazards, of course, is what it implies. Not only did FEMA, which be the old civil defense agency became through several transitions, want to prepare for the enemy attack, which was still of, of clear and present danger in that time, but also there were such things as man-made disasters that they found that civilian preparedness could help with and they designed at that point the what they call the four pillars of emergency management preparedness mitigation response and recovery okay and when it's all over and done with that is what we in sandwich as the emergency management agency are responsible for and and what does that include obviously the, the preparedness would be having a plan correct I am responsible for writing the emergency operations plan for the city and maintaining it, which also entails the resource lists of where things would come from when the flag flies. And so why is it so important? We have all kinds of uh, local agencies, state agencies, federal agencies. Why is it so important to have an organization at the local level? All disasters are local. This is something that people tend to forget. And this was the, what people thought was a dirty little secret that just leaked out for the first time during Katrina. But this is something that we'd been harping on for years in emergency management. You had better be prepared to shift for yourself during that first 48 to 72 hours before the cavalry comes over the hill. And when somebody tells you to evacuate, you do it. But that's a whole nother story. But it's going to take, in case of a large-scale issue, such as a tornado or a transportation accident or something like that causing widespread disruptions, it's going to take at least 48 hours for outside help to be marshaled and brought in. And in that 48 hours, there'd better be a local plan in place. Well, and we saw this with 9-11 with cell towers and people unable to communicate and sometimes I think that technology lulls us into a false sense of security. And we do. We, we, it does because it's nice to have cell phones and communication on your hip, but people don't realize that that's probably the most vulnerable point of our infrastructure. As people found out during 9-11 and uh, during the, uh, I believe it was a bridge collapse of a, on an interstate mm -hmm. in uh, the Minneapolis area. Cell phone system failed first. So let's take a plan like what you have in Sandwich and a plan like they had in New Orleans. 
obviously the demographics are different. We're on a much larger scale, but how do they compare to one another? It's all, it's a matter of scale. And I will tell you right now, and that plan was available online, the New Orleans plan. They had a beautiful plan. They didn't execute it. It's all in the execution. So if, that's one of those four pillars that you right, talked about. Okay. Exactly. That's response. And there's a wide gulf between standing and delivering the goods and saying, oh, my God, what do we do next? Well, it's that whole panic. Right. It's not just having the plan. It's actually, as you said, executing it and following the plan. Exactly. So my next question would be, who is it? Whose responsibility is it to execute the plan? My responsibility is to compile the plan and to get the plan in the hands of the people that are going to execute it with me. Ultimately, of course, I work for the mayor, Tom Thomas, of the city of Sandwich. And I'm responsible to him to make sure he's got the things he needs to do what he has to do when the flag flies. All right, but you are joined by, well, let's talk about your volunteers, because you obviously can't do this job by no, yourself. No, no, I work very closely with the police chief of right now is Bill King. He's also the chief of the fire protection district, and I worked very well with Rick Olson, the former police chief of Sandwich. They're our partners. We all, the, the, Rick and Bill King's predecessor and I sat in a room when we, we decided that the emergency operations plan needed to be revised, and we sat in a room and hammered it out, the three of us, and because we're the ones that are going to have to make sure that this is executed correctly. So why the need for an EMA when you do have a fire protection district and a police department, or in the case of a, a rural area, a sheriff's department? Why do you need that extra coverage. They're busy. Okay. Your police department is furnishing law enforcement and public safety services. Your fire department is providing fire suppression, fire prevention, and emergency medical. If you delegate the emergency management function to say a police department lieutenant or fire department lieutenant, you are not going to give that the proper attention because there's other things to do. It's not, and this is kind of something that's come up in the last couple of years is that as tax revenues dwindle and budgets decrease, there's that thought to push off that emergency management function as a part-time function to somebody that does other things as fill-in work. It's not fill-in work. It's a mistake to do it that way. Well, we're going to continue that thought uh, after a quick break. Don't go away. We'll be back with Tom Sikora in just a moment. Welcome back to Fox Valley in Focus. We're talking with Tom Sikora, the executive director or director of director. Sandwich Emergency Management Agency, about the need for a, kind of a partnership with the Fire Protection District and the police and sheriff's office to kind of fill in the holes uh, when crisis, crisis arises. And one of the things we talked about during the break was that it's very common in an economy like the one we're in right now to say, oh, we need to make some cuts. And invariably, when you do that, that's when the need presents itself. Exactly. I have some of my peers, part of our organizational apparatus is that we belong to a mutual aid organization which extends into the south suburbs of Chicago. It's a relationship I had before I came here and I preserved it when I came here for information sharing and what have you. And I look at those guys during my monthly visits with them when we meet and I see that some of them are being victimized by that kind of a thing. Their municipalities are saying, well, we don't need this anymore. We can bump this off on the police department or the fire department. For emergency management generally to be effective, it only ha not only has to be independent, but it also has to report to the chief executive of the government body. That way the director or coordinator or whatever you call your emergency management mm -hmm. person knows where he derives his authority. There's no ambiguity, absolute clarity, and I'm very blessed to where I got that kind of relationship with Tom Thomas. Now, is your position an appointed position or is it an elected position? I'm appointed. 
okay? And so it would be very important for you to be able to uh, have a relationship with the people that you report oh, absolutely. to. Oh, uh, absolutely, absolutely. And again, I'm very fortunate that I've, I've always had a wonderful working relationship with not only Tom and the council and the police and fire chiefs, but the guys that actually put their boots on the ground. I, I have a wonderful relationship with the, the police officers in town and a good working relationship with the firemen. So it all works well. Let's talk about some of the volunteers because without the actual manpower, the plan that you have can't be executed. That's correct. Uh, I'm very fortunate that I have about a dozen really, really good and giving people that donate their time. Well, most of our efforts, as far as the volunteers are concerned, are geared towards severe weather spotting. And these people give their time to learn about these things. They give of their time to go out when most people would stay in the house mm -hmm. and stay under cover to go out and meet these things. And they put themselves in the way of storms so the rest of the community can have adequate warning. Well, other than a willingness to serve, like what would the job description be for someone who wanted to be an EMA volunteer? For the purposes of our agency, uh, as we say in our website, if you provide the enthusiasm, we'll provide the training. What we do is we require our folks to go through the weather service training on severe weather spotting, which is about two hours in the spring. We alternate. Once a year, we'll either bring the weather service person out to train both our folks and whatever interested citizens want to come out. And then on the off year, I have an outstanding working relationship with Gilbert Savenst up at uh, Northern Illinois University. He's the staff meteorologist and an old Calumet City boy like myself. And he comes down and does a talk on the off year on not only advanced concepts in severe weather spotting, but he does a lot of safety oriented stuff. What kind of age requirement do you have for your volunteers? 18 or older. Okay. Uh, which is interesting because when I first got into it, I was, we had a program back in Calumet City where I used to live where I was 15 years old and I was allowed in and gave a few guys some gray hair over the years. But it was such a success in my head that I reinstated the program in Calumet City. Uh, we had five kids, four of which, three went on to be police officers, or no, two went on to be police officers. One is a uh, commissioned medical officer in the Army, and the third had a successful tour as a military police officer. So that system worked. We don't have enough of a body of volunteers yet to kind of try to start a program like that, and I don't know if there's necessarily a need from, for it. Okay. But I, I'm always looking for willing and enthusiastic folks over 18 to come participate in our program. Well, other than the weather component, what other responsibilities do your volunteers have? Sometimes we will assist the police department in, like in the Halloween uh, that just passed, we did uh, some some augmented street patrol, just provide a presence, eyes and ears. Uh, we also assisted in traffic control during the late football playoffs at uh, the high school. It just when they need help, we try to help them out when they can. Well, I noticed on your website that you have, uh, which is very informative, by the way, Thank you. that you have some photographs of the center, which is quite sophisticated, and it looks like the, the weather component is a pretty big factor in the equipment that you have in the Well, facility. it's a big deal for us. Uh, our emergency operating center is underneath the public works building. When they built that facility, they built it with a flexicore floor. So we have our EOC and equipment underneath there. And I'm very fortunate that Don Frederick, my assistant, and the folks that worked for him at that time, built a wonderful system down there. They had transplanted an old console from the police department 
and set up some things there, all the radio equipment and what have you. And then my boss for my day job was nice enough to let me have some retired computers and I, or monitors rather, and I augmented it with some things that I'd scrounged. As a volunteer, you learn how to scrounge things from here and there. And we put that all together and it performs a function. We've got radar feeds by internet. We've got both public safety and amateur radio communications. We've got voice over internet and video conferencing if we need it. Okay. So we're, we're quite set. Well, I'm glad you brought up the internet because there's no way that technology has not changed the way you do your job. So let's rewind to 20 years ago and, and how what you did then in emergency management compares to what you do now. When I first started in this, there was no information on weather spotting. Some very thin brochures uh, from the Weather Service, they hadn't even started their formalized training program at that time. This was early 70s, so it was just getting started and okay. being phased in by office. You just couldn't, there was no information. There, there isn't like now tornado video on demand, which is not only entertainment, but it's very instructive for our purposes. These guys go out there and they do silly things and we grab onto that and use it as training tools. I'm going to interrupt you for a moment. We're going to take a quick break and when we come back I want you to finish that story. Thank you. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We're talking about the changes in technology and, and how that has affected your role. As I was saying earlier, we are very lucky to have these people out here on the plains that'll go and they'll chase storms and they'll get the entire life cycle of a tornado beginning to end. And that, of course, is a wonderful training tool for our folks because you could go your entire life. Where I used to live, I believe I saw perhaps one tornado in 28 years. And I've seen more storms in the last 10 than I have in my entire 20. I actually saw more storms in the first couple of years I was here because you've got a nicer vantage. You don't have buildings. You can see for forever. So the ability to take these, this video that these people get and translate it in, that into training is wonderful. Um, plus cell phones. 20 years ago we used CB radio and hope for the best. Now we have public safety FM communications, we have amateur radio, we have cell phones, we have radar in our pockets with internet which we never had before. We used, to, even up until a couple of years ago, we used to have to rely on somebody back at the EOC looking at a radar presentation to tell us what was coming. Now we have radar, mobile radar. One of my guys has a, a complete setup to get mobile internet on a nice size display in his van that he uses for these purposes. It's, it's just amazing how simple getting the information has become. Interpreting is still a matter of brain power, but the knowledge is out there and a lot easier to gain. You don't have to search for it the way you had to before. Well, now that you have the information, it's easier to gain. What about disseminating the information? How has that changed? Again, we are very fortunate that we can get it back to the weather service directly, either by cell phone or by radio. If the cell phones, as I I like to tell people cell phones are very fragile. You know, the infrastructure for cell phones, mm -hmm. that usually goes first. But we've got a wonderful backup in both our own system radios plus amateur radio back to the weather service. But of course, getting it out to the people is the one best way for people to get weather information is NOAA All Hazards Radio. It is still the best way. It's always been the best way. They've improved it considerably. The equipment is improved so it doesn't alarm for every occurrence like it used to. You can program it so it only alarms for your particular slice of county and the events you want it to alarm for. 
and it's just as necessary in your home as a smoke detector. And I don't know that most people would even consider that because uh, radio listenership has dropped significantly. People get their news from other sources. True. And so uh, what about like the, the old standby uh, of the air sirens? Sirens are outdoor warning devices. They are meant to alert people engaged in outdoor activities. Now, most of our weather events occur during the summer. Where are you in the summer? You're either outside or inside in the air conditioning in a buttoned up house. You shouldn't expect to be able to hear those sirens in there. The sirens are not a cure-all. They're great if you're at the park or down at the beach or what have you. But if you're in your home, sirens are an augmentation but not the end all and be all. Once again, it starts and ends at NOAA Weather Radio. Even your television broadcast, they get their information from the weather service. So it's just that many seconds down in the food chain. The first thing the weather service does when it puts out a warning is it goes out on that weather radio. Well, in, in this area, let's talk Western Kane County, uh, Kendall County, Southern DeKalb County, what would be the greatest risk that, that you would try to alert people to? Well, obviously, would be a tornado. Okay. There is also great discussion going on in the emergency management community right now and the storm spotter community about what do we do with straight line winds. These derecho events, as the Weather Service calls them, have they've not been more commonplace in the last couple of years, but we know what they are now. It's kind of like the idea that we people believe that we're seeing more tornadoes now than before. No, we're not seeing more tornadoes. The area is getting more populated. People know what they're looking at. It's an educational thing. And the discussion is, is whether or not we should alert people for high straight line winds. Because the death certificate is not going to say get killed, got killed by debris from a tornado or got killed by debris from straight line winds. It's going to say dead. So that's a discussion that we're having at this time amongst ourselves and trying to figure out where to characterize it because, well, let's see, we're going to warn for this, 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 and this, but not this, this, and this, but then you've got this big body of this and you're going to start desensitizing people to warnings. And then you're going to have terminology issues. As in, uh, there was a very noted incident a couple of years ago, uh, Greensburg, Kansas, the entire town was virtually leveled by a large tornado. It was not a particularly big town, no much, not much more bigger than Sandwich. But the Weather Service came out with something called a tornado emergency, which in their heads was more serious than a tornado warning, but it set heads to spinning. People didn't know what to do with that. So the nuance of language is very important when you send out those right. alerts. And then when it's all bought and paid for, it doesn't matter how you alert if people don't do anything with it. And that's where the education component comes in. My 78-year-old mother, God bless her, I gave her a weather radio many years ago, set it up for her, and I had come to her house for a visit and it's unplugged and in the corner. Oh. Mom, what are you doing? I've lived this long. I've seen a tornado. It didn't kill me. That is the perception a lot of the public. Either it's not going to get me or it can't happen here or some form of denial. Or if I don't know about it, it won't, it won't affect me. Yeah, we had a poodle that was like that. Something scary came in the house. It stuck its head in the couch cushions. A lot of us have our heads in the couch cushions. But the thing is, all the warnings and all of our activities won't matter if people on an individual level don't know what to do with it. That's why the website. That's why I have no problem going out to speak to any group that'll have me on personal preparedness. That's why we do this stuff. That is the preparedness component of this. Now, you also have monthly meetings. Are those limited to just your volunteers, or are those open to the public? Interested parties. Okay. If you're interested in what we're doing, we usually either review what we've been doing, 
in the month prior, do after action things on okay. activities we've already done, or we're starting to get in the mode where, believe it or not, the snow hasn't flown yet, but we're planning for spring. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time. We'll direct people to your website. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. That's our show for this time. I'm Cindy Bravos. Thank you for watching. We'll see you on the next Fox Valley in Focus.